Alexander, thank you so much for sharing your story. When you were in that midst of fear, guilt, and shame, what stuck out to me about your story is that you went to Scripture to find sweetness. You went to Scripture to find sweetness. And I don't know where you are on your journey. We have those of you watching online. She shared a lot about her story. And let me, let me just share with you, at least within this community of faith, the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, which is one of over 40,000 denominations, there are three things that we love. And these are really three things that I really believe. Uh, I want whatever I believe in to be based upon three S's. The Savior, Scripture, and Sweetness. Is Jesus, Jesus, what does Jesus have to say? I listen to my Savior, and I go to the Scripture to find out what the Savior says, and I go here to find sweetness. And that's what we, that's what we find. We find sweetness in Him. And there was another woman in this amazing book, uh, the Gospel of John. She was a woman from this town of Samaria who also found sweetness. And this morning, the few moments that we have, I'd like to share with you a few, a few words about this amazing story in John chapter 4. Jesus is traveling with his disciples. And he says, guys, we need, we, need to, we need to leave. We need to go back to Galilee. We need to leave Judea, go back to Galilee. But we need to stop by a place called Samaria. And while Jesus was in Samaria, he met a woman and in John chapter 4, verse 7, let me read these verses with you. John chapter 4, verse 7 says, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. See, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they did not get along. They hated each other. I remember when I was uh, pastoring in Wisconsin, and I would bring up the Chicago Bears, the Packers fans did not like me. <laughs> Packers fans and Chicago Bears fans did not get along. Samaritans and Jews did not get along. Why was this Jew asking this woman, a Samaritan woman, for water? Well, the, the text continues, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the water is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And notice what Jesus says in verse 13. He says this, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What he's saying to the woman is, the water that you're drinking, you think it's sweet? Wait till you drink the water that I have to give you. You tried mango juice or a mango smoothie? Any of you like boba? Every time I go to Joe Yi, I always get avocado boba, right? Avocado boba. I love it. Any avocado boba fans here? Right? My Spanish, some of my Spanish friends are like, That's, that is a, a curse. We don't take avocados and make it sweet, right? But in Asian culture, especially in Filipino culture, we like it sweet. You think that's sweet? Avocado boba or mango boba or whatever you get, right? Brown sugar boba, whatever, whatever you get. Wait till you taste the sweetness of the living water. Wait till you taste the sweetness of the living water. And that's exactly what he says to this woman. I love one writer who says, He who seeks to quench his thirst at the fountains of this world will drink only to thirst again. Everywhere, men are unsatisfied. They long for something to supply the need of the soul, and only one can meet that want, the need of the world. The desire of all nations is Christ. So, Nestor, you're saying that only Jesus satisfies. He's saying that in the text. So what does that look like? Follow me here. You might not have seen this before. Now in verse 15. Jesus said to her, okay? Now the woman says in verse 15. The woman said, look, all right, you've intrigued me. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. All right, you're talking about the sweet water? Give me that. I want that water. I've been working here all my, I'm so tired here. Drawing water in the, under, the, under this cover in, in the middle of nowhere on a hot day. I want that living water. And look what Jesus says in verse 16. Jesus said to her, 
This is probably not the most tactful thing to say. But he says, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Uh, Jesus, what are you doing? This is not the way that we should witness and tell people about our faith. Go call your husband. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, I'm glad that you want this living water, but you need to stop drinking stale water. These men in your life who you think are satisfying you, they're not satisfying you. And what Jesus does is he tactfully confronts the Samaritan woman and exposes her emptiness. Jesus pulls a flashlight, you know, on a phone, you could put the flashlight on. He pulls out a flashlight to point out the darkness in her heart, but pay close attention to how she reacts. Let's, let's see how she receives it. The text says in verse 19, as she's feeling the guilt and shame of what he just said. She says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem and the place where people are where people ought to worship. There was this controversy of where they should worship. The Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gerasim. The Jewish people worshipped on, on, on Jerusalem. And so what is she doing? She, she feels the, the shame and the guilt from that flashlight. And what she does is she, she, she deflects. One writer says this, she could deny nothing, but she tried to evade all mention. What word did I say? Evade. Come on, when you put a flashlight on a cockroach, what does it do? It evades. And that's exactly what she was, trying, she was doing. And that this book, The Desire of Ages, continues with deep reverence. She said, sir, I perceive that you were a prophet. Then hoping to silence conviction, she turned to points of religious controversy. The Samaritan, use, uh, the Samaritan woman is using religious controversy to avoid inspection. She uses external ideas to avoid internal work. And look, when someone touches a sensitive area, Right? Something that we don't really want to talk about, like that shameful thing that we have done or that the, guilt, the thing that we feel are really guilty for. What do we do when someone touches a sensitive area? We usually evade. My feet were hurting and my, one of my children accidentally stepped on my foot. I evaded because it's sensitive. And why does the Samaritan woman avoid Christ's inspection? Why is, the, is she scared of being exposed? You know Why? Because she's fearful of guilt and shame. She's fearful of that. Perhaps she doesn't want to get caught. Perhaps she doesn't want to be really known to the deepest part of her soul. Perhaps she fears that if people really knew who she was, that they won't really like her. She might lose her friends. She might lose her influence. She might not have the same followers on Instagram or on Facebook. Perhaps she feels she wants to protect her good image. All right? Perhaps she wants to pretend that she's better than she really is. And friends, we are, we are very good at doing that. I am very good at doing that. She wants to tell people or pers- let people know that she's not really that bad. And we can surmise many reasons for her, ev- her evasion. But I think this one is the most probable, that she never really had a real and lasting relationship before. Because you see, she had five husbands, she had five men in her life, and the last one was not her husband. This is exactly what I believe that Jesus is trying to tell her. The Samaritan woman doesn't want to go deep, but what she does is she comes back to surface with a religious controversy. Jesus takes this surface issue, and then he finds an opportunity to give her some sweetness and to give her some grace. And notice what Jesus says in these verses in verse 21. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those and uh, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And then the woman said to Him, "Okay, okay, okay. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying." And then she says, "I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things." And Jesus says these words, "I who speak to you am He." 
That's me. What is Jesus saying, friends? Their problem is not, he's saying to the, 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 he's saying to the Samaritan woman, the problem is not the place where you worship. Listen to me, Samaritan woman, please. I'm trying to give you some living water, and I'm trying to show you that the waters that you're drinking from are stale. The problem is not the place of worship, woman. The real problem is not the place of worship. The problem is the object of your worship. You are not worshiping in spirit and truth. You are not worshiping God. You are actually worshiping and adoring men. But now, Samaritan woman, you have the opportunity to be adored and to adore and be adored by a man who will satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. Who is this man, you might wonder? And looks right at the woman and says, I'm that man. I'm that man. So where does true, lasting joy come from, friends? The only place that we can find eternal joy is an, in an intimate relationship with Jesus. It's the only place. That's the only place where we can find this joy, which will then rid us of guilt and shame. So what does this look like? What does this look like? I'm going to draw something here on the flip chart pretty soon. But I want, you to show, I want to show you the reaction of this woman, okay? Remember, Jesus called her out. He, look what happens in verses 28 and 29. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. This man called me out. Can this be the Christ? Verse 30, they went out of the town and were coming to him. The Samaritan woman is shocked by Christ's words. She sprints to the city, and she tells everyone about this man. What was the one thing, friends, what was the one thing the Samaritan woman shares with everyone in town? She says, come see a man who told me all things that I ever th did. And why is this so monumental? What is so significant about the reality that Jesus knows everything about you and me? Even the, the stuff that we've the guilt and shame that we feel for the stuff that we did this week that we're really guilty and feel ashamed for. Why is that so significant that Jesus knows everything about you? And why is it that the Samaritan woman is so thrilled about this news? Because she can finally be in a relationship where she can safely be herself. For her whole life, her whole life, she was trying to find intimacy. Okay? And the only way that we can have and she can have intimacy, there has to be two things. Number one, vulnerability, that I can be open and be myself. And number two, in order to have intimacy, not only do you need to have vulnerability, you also need what we call, can you guys read my handwriting here? I know, I have bad handwriting. In order for any intimate relationship to work, there has to be vulnerability and safety. Vulnerability and safety. She was trying to find intimacy with all of these men in her life. She tried to be all vulnerable, but she wasn't safe. Jesus calls her out and makes her feel very vulnerable, ashamed. She feels the guilt. She feels shame. For what she did. But not once, not once did Jesus shame her for her wrongdoing. He gave her everything that she was looking for, which was what? A safe place to be herself even in her brokenness. This is what she was looking for. This is what she was looking for. <laughs> Let me relate it this way. My wife, Catherine and I, we have we're close. We have intimacy. I drop the ball. And there are many times where I feel very vulnerable. Like, okay, yeah, I didn't. I said I was going to do that. I didn't do that. But you know what's amazing? I can go back home. And yeah, we have to have tough conversations sometimes about the, the times when I drop the ball. But I know that I always have a safe place at home. Because my wife doesn't love me based on my actions. I mean, actions are important. She loves Nestor. 
she accepts me the way that I am. And I am 110% convinced, friends. I am 110% convinced that the only way that for you and I, for all of us, to experience no more fear of guilt and shame is to find a place, a safe place, where we can go with that guilt and shame. And the, same, the safe place where you can be yourself and you can have a God who loves you unconditionally even when you are in your brokenness and as you continue to, to, to stumble and fall, the only place you can find that is in the Messiah and in Jesus. That's the only place. The only place. Look, guilt and shame is a real thing. The guilt and shame is a real thing. But you know what's amazing about Jesus? That he allows me to be vulnerable and he doesn't condemn me. In fact, the guilt and shame that you felt this week and that I felt this week, uh, felt this week for some wrongdoing that we've done was because I have done something wrong. Because I have messed up and I have dropped the ball. And then just Jesus stand over us and say, Aha, uh-huh, I got you, Nestor. Shame on you. No. He says, you're drinking stale water. Let me give you a better option. Why don't you take a drink of me? That's how he treats me. And in those moments where you feel vulnerable, the only place that you can find release from that shame and guilt, the best place, is in the safe arms of Jesus, who says, hey, you who, have drink- who are drinking stale water, it's okay. Taste me and see that I'm good. And trust me, when you taste that forgiveness and that sweetness, you're going to go to every village and to the ends of the earth to tell people about that grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. So this vulnerability thing, like how how can I even do that? How can I have a close relationship with this Christ? I feel vulnerable at times for the times I have dropped the ball and I've messed up. I don't feel safe. I want to, but I don't. Is there anyone in Scripture who exemplified vulnerability and safety? Was there anyone in Scripture who exemplified vulnerability? Let me read to you a text here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Last two verses. Jesus, who did I say? Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. How do we come to that place of even being vulnerable with God? I mean, I understand he's safe, but I don't even want to be vulnerable with him we realize that Jesus became the most vulnerable for us. Do you know how criminals were died on the cross on, 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 um, when they were crucified? Yes, they were, the hands and their, na- their, their feet were nailed to a cross. Out of respect for the Messiah, people draw a loincloth or clothing around him. Criminals that died on the cross died completely naked. Jesus, he who knew no sin but became sin for us, became, he took our shame and our guilt and our nakedness complete, literally. He who was the creator of the universe and who created you in your mother's womb was the one who became vulnerable by becoming like me and dying on a cross without any clothes. And as I behold him and I look to him, I don't know about you. I don't see someone who's there to condemn me. I see my Savior that the Scripture talks about, and I taste sweetness. And as the praise team comes up here, I want to ask you a a question, friend. Those of you watching online, uh, have you tasted sweetness this week? Have you tasted sweetness this week? Have I tasted sweetness this week? We can taste that sweetness, that sweetness of safety that God offers me. 
where I can be truly myself, a God who will forgive me. 1 Corinthians 1.9, 1 John 1.9 says, uh, if we confess our sins, He, speaking about Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some of our unrighteousness. Is that what the text says? It says all of our unrighteousness. Though our cloth might be stained, our clothes might be stained, we can come to a Savior that accepts us that we, as we are, as broken as we are, as vulnerable as we are, but at the same time have a space, a safe space to experience his, his, uh, the refreshing waterfall of His forgiveness. Friend, the opportunity is there. And if God is speaking to your heart, I want to invite you. We have a connect card in the pew in front of you. We even have it online. You can scan the QR code. Uh, you can even pull up, put it, uh, fill, fill out that web, uh, go on that website and fill out our connect card. We want to know. If you want to take that next step, if you want to follow Sa- what, what Sandra did, powerful testimony, thank you so much for sharing that, of just taking a step with the Savior and experiencing that sweetness. Let us know as a pastoral team. I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. I want to join a Bible study group. I want to be baptized. Let us know as, as a pastoral team on the card. You can submit this on the way out as we t- collect our tithes and offerings. We can even submit it online and we'll get in touch with you as a pastoral team. But could it be that amazing grace, that the grace of Jesus is sweeter than we think it is? I think so. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And we're going to sing it from hearts that are tasting the sweetness of Jesus today. So let's sing together.